the light waves, whatever light waves are, and make a blue shift. If the star is leaving, it would make a red shift. And so when the red shift was discovered years ago, they looked around the heavens and found most of the stars are giving a red shift. And they said, wow, this proves they're leaving. No, it doesn't, but that was the assumption. And then they said, if all the stars are moving away, that proves there was a Big Bang. That was the evidence for the Big Bang Theory, <laughs> the red shift. Talk about a lack of logic, but uh, that's what they said. Okay. This fellow says there was an early sign that red shifts reliably indicate the distance of galaxies. For quasars, however, the diagram shows a wide scatter in apparent brightness at every red shift. He said, in fact, there is little correlation of brightness to red shift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of intrinsic luminosities, as most people believe, or the red shifts do not indicate distance. Sky and Telescope, December 94. Um, same magazine said, uh, thus for the only conclusion that can be drawn is that at least some quasars are relatively nearby and a large fraction of their redshift is due to something other than expansion of the universe. So if somebody tells you we know the distance to stars because of redshift, say, I'm sorry, that is simply not correct. We don't know the distance because of redshift. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, from our ministry. It's $5 for a 900-page book. Excellent book, loaded with stuff on creation evolution. He's got a whole section about the Doppler effect and the expanding universe. The Science News 95 said, Another set of observations indicates that the universe appears to be 8.4 to 10.6 billion years old. The new work relied on the Hubble Space Telescope to obtain distance to faraway galaxies. A team led by Tanver at the University of England used a two-step method to estimate the Hubble constant. I always get a kick out of that. Here they've got an equation which involves a number that you're going to multiply, like an algebraic equation, and they can change that number. They call it a constant, but they change it all the time. Okay. I taught algebra for years. I'm telling you, you change one letter in an equation or one value in an equation, you change the outcome. That's why they're always getting wild numbers for the age of the universe, because the Hubble constant is not a constant at all. Okay, let's go on here. He said, first they observed a type of standard candle, stars known as Cepheid variables, to find the distance to the spiral galaxy M96. He said, you have to be very careful about drawing conclusions because of the Hubble constant, because measurements have huge systematic errors. Astronomers believed the veil, one of the best studied supernova remnants, was 2,500 years, light years away and 18,000 years old. They were quite wrong. In fact, the veil is only 1,500 light years away and 5,000 years old, from Discover Magazine, January of 2001. An article about Rip Van Winkle showing stars are much younger than they thought. Um, the article, University Around Us at Cambridge University, said even the nearest Cephids are so remote, it's difficult to determine their absolute distance with any accuracy, any great accuracy. All large distances in astronomical literature are subject to an error of perhaps 10% from this cause alone. He said, we know that faintness, you know, how bright the star is, arises from two causes, distance and absorbing matter in space, and it's generally not possible to apportion it between the two. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, and find out what happened to Halt and Harp, who dared to question the redshift theory. Good way to lose your job. There's discrimination against those because they're looking for, uh, looking for anything to hang on to this dumb Big Bang Theory is the problem. Big Bang Theory is a dud. Fred Hoyle said that 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. Okay, Isaiah 40 tells us the Lord sits on the circle of the earth, and it says he stretched out the heavens like a curtain. Isaiah 42 talks about the stretching of the heavens. Isaiah 45 says he stretched out the heavens. Jeremiah 10 says he stretched out the heavens. There are several theories of what's causing the red shift. One theory is the stretching from the creation. This is a normal thing you would expect because he stretched out the heavens like a curtain, just like the Bible told us. Maybe that's the only reason we have a red shift. Second theory is the light's getting tired, traveling great distance. Third theory is as it travels through whatever space is made up, maybe space is nothing, maybe space is something, we don't know what space is, but as the light travels, that may automatically be a phenomena that causes the red shift. It could be the Doppler effect, the star could be moving away, I don't know, and nobody knows, okay? It could be the light is being speeded up or slowed down as it goes past a dense gravitational mass in space. We simply don't know what's causing the red shift. Next question, I get asked this question quite frequently actually, is the sun shrinking? The sun is obviously burning, you can step outside and look at it in the daytime. The sun is losing about 5 million tons of mass every second. The sun is obviously burning and losing an enormous amount of fuel. So if you go backwards in time and add 5 million tons per second to the sun, you start to create a problem at some point. I don't know what the number is, and I wouldn't give a number because as soon as I give a number and say X number of million years ago this would have happened, the atheist or the skeptic will pick on the number and miss the concept. The fact is the sun is burning. 
If the sun were larger, it would begin to suck Mercury and Venus in, first of all, Mercury first and then Venus, and then slowly affect Earth. Uh, the Bulletin of American Astronomical Society in uh, 1979 said, since 1836, more than 100 direct observers, different observers at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest the sun's diameter is shrinking at the rate of about a tenth of a percent each century, which works out to be five feet per hour. Now, whether the number's right, I don't know. But the fact is, it's pretty obvious the sun is burning, and the sun, for a hundred years of measurements, they said it's shrinking about five feet an hour. Of course, now the sun is gigantic, about 880,000 miles in diameter, so it's not a problem. We're not going to lose it anytime soon. Uh, Science Magazine ran an article in 1980 that said several d indirect techniques also confirm the sun is shrinking, although these inferred collapse are only about one-seventh as much. By that thinking, the sun would have been touching the earth uh, 100, 158 million years ago. And again, I don't, that's not my number. Somebody else uh, came up with that as a possible calculation that the sun would have been touching the earth. The fact is the sun is shrinking. This chart shows the measurements of the not only the polar diameter but the equatorial diameter. The sun has uh, north and south pole like the Earth does. Both measurements are diminishing in the last 160 years. It's been observed the sun is shrinking. Now the sun oscillates. It swells and shrinks and swells and shrinks, but the overall trend is quite obviously toward shrinking. The sun is burning. That creates a problem. If you go backwards in time, the sun would be bigger and more massive, which is going to upset the gravitational pull. So I don't think it's logical to say the Earth's been going around the sun for billions of years while the sun is constantly losing this mass and losing its gravitational pull. To me, that invokes the miracle. It's much simpler to say the system is not billions of years old like they're telling us. God created everything about 6,000 years ago exactly like the Bible says. Okay, what about carbon dating? Every seminar I do, somebody will say, wait a minute, carbon dating proves the Earth is millions of years old. Oh, no, it doesn't. The fossils are actually dated by their position in the geologic column. We cover that in seminar part four. And the geologic column does not exist any place in the world. Radiometric dating would not even be possible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Article in journal, uh, American Journal of Science magazine talked about this. Ever since William Smith at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, this guy said, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. So they don't date fossils by carbon dating or potassium argon dating. This is a mammoth tooth. They date them by the geologic column. They pick a spot and say, wow, that era was, you know, so many thousand years ago, and so this must be that old. Fossils are not dated by carbon dating. But let me explain how carbon dating works. The Earth's atmosphere is about 100 miles thick. On this globe, it doesn't even show up. I mean, it's the thickness of the, of the paint, basically. 100 miles is not much. The space shuttle whizzes around just above the atmosphere, so it cuts down on drag, and they can get no friction up there. Uh, still get lousy gas mileage, though. The... Um, Air, 100 miles thick, is mostly nitrogen, 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.06% carbon dioxide, and that's what plants breathe, CO2. Some people say 0 0.09 or 0 0.03, I don't know, it's, it varies, I'm sure, location to location. But there's not a lot of CO2 in the air. If you increase CO2, plants grow faster, which is a frustration for the environmentalist wackos when they burn forests, you know. All the CO2 is released, and the trees next door grow faster. So it doesn't uh, create an environmental crisis like they want you to believe. Uh, there's extremely small quantities of radioactive carbon-14. The way this works, uh, radiation from the sun strikes the atmosphere, super high speed energy comes down, bangs into the nitrogen, and changes it to carbon-14. Just a quick simple chemistry lesson here. Carbon and nitrogen are right next to each other on the periodic table. Nitrogen is number 14, carbon is number 12. But if the nitrogen gets blasted by radiation, it turns into carbon-14. Normal carbon is called carbon-12. Here we have some what's called radioactive carbon, carbon-14. It's very rare, um, and it doesn't stay stable because it's always breaking apart. You can hear it with a Geiger counter. You know, in the movies, they got the Geiger counter getting by the uranium and going click, 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 click. Well, the same thing with carbon-14. It breaks apart. It's falling apart. And it's turning back into nitrogen and disappearing, which is a gas. It disappears into the air. Um, Carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere by the sun, 
it breaks down at the rate of about half of it will break down every 5,730 years. This is called the half-life. So if I gave you a pile of carbon-14 and you waited 5,730 years, half of it would turn back to nitrogen and you'd end up with half a pile. If you wait another 5,700 years, half of that is going to turn to nitrogen. You end up with a fourth of a pile. In theory, it never goes to zero. It goes from half to fourth to eighth to sixteenth, etc. But plants are always breathing in carbon-14 in the photosynthesis process. They're breathing in carbon. Some of it's carbon-14. Most of it's normal carbon-12. Animals eat the plants and make it part of their body.